Good morning, everybody, and welcome again to our workshop this week. And for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Sue, and I'm the Garden Guru from Garden Shop. So welcome to everybody again. Um, yes, all the old familiar faces or names that I can see on my screen here. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to the newcomers. And today we are talking about herbs still like we did last week. But today we are going to concentrate on the fragrance herbs and what their function is in our garden. Also where they grow, where they come from, etc, etc. So uh, Kay has generously prepared a beautiful PowerPoint slides for us today as well, um, like always, and thank you very much, Kay. Um, later on, we will do the draw for our winner for our Kershaw's competition as well. Um, so all of that is coming up, and then we've got an exciting competition for today as well. So without further ado, let's go to our PowerPoint presentation for this week and that should be it I think uh, there we go and I'm just going to quickly admit these people here as well and I'm going to take all of this up here and minimize there we go and this is our PowerPoint slides for today. So, as I said, we're talking about fragrance herbs or um, aromatic herbs, what their uses are, um, and where could you grow them in your garden today. Now, <laughs> the use of fragrance herbs um, is well recorded throughout history, and until the reign of King George IV, and he was about 1820 to 1830, um, all the monarchs, the English monarchs, actually appointed um, people to sort of strew herbs in front of them uh, so that um, they can proceed the, the procession. Um, and these strewers, they scattered all sorts of aromatic herbs, such as rosemary, thyme, rue. And why did they do that? They did it to ward off diseases. Um, and these ladies, they were called strewing ladies, and they had quite a, a, an important uh, job in the um, palace as such. Um, and why did they do this? Because during the Black Plague period, um, people believed that the plague was caused as a result of bad odors or foul air. And they thought that if they scattered these herbs, that that would sort of reduce the foul air and then ward off the disease, which today we know is not true, although I suppose there is some truth in it, um, because usually things that smell foul are either rotten or it's actually stuff that you should actually avoid. Um, but I don't think string herbs would, would, would help all that much. So the plague doctors even stuffed their masks, and you can see that those long sort of beaky type masks that they wore, they stuck those with herbs also to basically war off the diseases um, and to keep the bad smells out because they thought that was causing the disease. And even though the doctors at the time didn't really know anything about germs, these techniques are not so much different from what we do today. We're also trying to purify the air and I mean we all know for the last year or so we've all been wearing masks etc um, but uh, not for the foul air as such but more so to ward off the germs but I suppose in cases um, foul air could indeed carry germs. Now there's another thing that was 
Um, I'm just going to go back to the slide because I don't know if you can see the picture. Um, anyway, um, I don't know if you can see the picture, um, but uh, another indication of bad smells being the cause of disease was also in the children's rhyme from that period. And many people believe that this rhyme re references the Black Death and uh, it also recommends carrying around posies and flowers to keep out the bad smells. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that, that little um, ditty, ringer, ringer roses, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Um, now, that sort of spread over in what we do today because dried herbs and essential oils we incorporated into potpourris, into snuff, into fumigants, and even scented water and um, some in insecticides. Uh, today, some judges, especially from, from British colonies and that, they still um, traditionally carry a posy of sweet herbs. And that is sort of symbolic in a way of shielding them from, from the badness of the rest of humanity in the courtroom. And the tradition persists even today, as I say, and um, you will always see monarchs um, carrying posies of flowers. No, it's not to make them look pretty. It also stems from that initial um, Black Death um, scenario where, where monarchs um, believed that that scented posies sort of um, chased away the, 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 the black death or the disease, etc., etc. And um, even brides, they also carry posies of flowers, some of them quite elaborate. Um, and that, that tradition also stems from, from carrying posies to wear or to, to, to sort of recounter diseases. Um, and we even put flowers on tombstones sometimes. Um, again, the tradition comes way, way back from those Black Death times. Now, the study of the healing power of fragrance herbs are called aromatherapy, and I'm quite sure you all know about that. And it's becoming more and more popular, and it's practiced as alternative healing. Now, these aromatherapy people, they make essential oils, tinctures, um, and the things are prepared from many herbs, sometimes a combination, sometimes just a singular herb, and specific scents are then associated with treating specific illnesses or diseases or um, things like that. Um, we, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Bach flower remedy, remedies. Those are um, homeopathic flower remedies, and I think you can get that at most of the sort of health shops. Um, and exactly in those remedies, particularly fra particular fragrances have been found to heal particular disorders and change moods. Now, um, in the garden, plants can have similar effects of raising your spirits um, when you smell them or soothing tension. Um, so make sure that you plant your favorite scented herbs where they are accessible and where you need them the most, maybe when you want to sort of relax a little bit. Um, now, the question is, why do plants actually have a strong scent? Or why do some, some plants have a very strong scent? Now, although the fragrance of herbs is the main reason for their cultivation, um, because um, we put it in our food and, you know, the, the, the flavor and the fragrance are actually sort of closely united. Um, but in actual fact, the scent represents nothing more than the waste products of the plant. In actual fact, if you want to be blunt, you could say it's plant's farts. So <laughs> luckily, their farts smell much better than our human farts. So substances such as geranoil, um, that is the, the, the main scent of roses, 
um, thyme oil and eucalyptal in thyme. Those are essential oils formed in the plant and then stored in the leaf near the, the surface of the leaf. Now, if you get pressure of movement, such as a browsing animal um, or even a strong breeze or even heat in sunlight, all those things can then cause these scents to be released. That's why often early in the morning or sort of later um, in the evening, that's when, when scents are the strongest. Um, and the plant then would release these chemicals to defend or shield the plant from injury. Um, it is the release of the evaporation of these waste materials that delights us when we walk on a lawn of thyme or um, penny royal um, or stand downwind from your wisteria flowering or a bush of rosemary um, on a hot day. So I've put together a few of my favorite scented herbs um, and not only because of their scent, but also because of their looks and, and what they do for me in my garden. And I'm going to <laughs> start off with the little humble viola odorata or the sweet violet. And I'm sure you all know exactly what it looks like. Um, it is quite a common plant um, in especially shade gardens, although this plant would grow both in shade and sun. Um, it would just have a bit smaller leaves in the sun. Um, but it's a semi evergreen rhizomatous perennial with slender stolons. You can see um, those thin little stems um, and then those tufts of um, sort of ovate leaves, nearly heart shaped leaves. And then they make the dark purple or white or sometimes yellowish flowers. And those are nicely scented. Um, about two centimeters across and they usually appear in late spring when they flower quite a lot um, and very pretty. They are easy to divide actually so once you've got a clump of them you can divide them um, and plant them all over your garden. They are fantastic for borders especially then borders in your herb gardens. So what do they do? The leaves and the flowers and the roots are used in essential oils. Um, it helps to release mucus. It's a cooling herb. It cleanses toxins. Um, it's an expectorant, uh, antiseptic, and it also um, seems to have anti-cancer effects. I think it's got to do with, with um, sort of um, uh, balancing the pH of the body. Um, now, flowers and young leaves are also added to salads or made into tea. Um, the flowers are also used as garnish for desserts. Sometimes they candied um, or added to vinegars or ices or syrups. So that's our little lovely viola odorata <coughs> or sweet violet. And um, plants related um, to the sweet violet that also stems from the same genus is your pansies and then your small little annual violas which could be planted as effectively but those are usually treated as annuals and they are not as sweetly scented as the common viola sweet violet or viola odorata the ordinary violet now this next one here is actually a <clears throat> plant that a lot of people aren't that familiar with, um, but it is quite a, 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 a nice plant to have in your garden. Personally, I do love this one as well, and that is Myrtus communis or myrtle. Now, we also get a Myrtus communis nana, which is a smaller, thinner leaf. Uh, the flowers do look exactly the same. They've got those little powder puff type white flowers with little yellow pinches at the top and then they can grow into quite sort of big shrubs about three meters tall if you leave them but they can also be pruned into hedging very easily or kept low or planted as topiary. 
Now, um, they are native to the Mediterranean, Southwest Europe. They're fully hardy and they grow in sun or in shade. So that is really, really nice. Now, the thing about myrtles too is, oh, sorry, before I get to that, um, why am I telling you where plants are coming from? Because that will tell you what sort of conditions these plants like. And coming from the Mediterranean, obviously Myrtus doesn't like to be waterlogged. They like well-drained soil. Now, I just love Myrtus, um, not only because uh, of its scent, but also because I love using it in cooking. Now, you'll see that the Myrtus actually eventually makes like a little purple berry. Um, and that, those berries, if they are dried, you can put them through your pepper grinder and then use them to season food. I particularly use it for, for, for delicate sort of French sauces. Um, and then also for all my white meat dishes like pork and um, all your poultry dishes. Um, traditionally, it's also used to flavor liqueurs. Um, especially in Corsica and Sardinia, where they come from. Um, and the, the, those blackberries are called mercens. And it's also used as a spice in the Middle East. They sometimes make soaps and, and other oils out of it. And it's also used for food flavoring. So myrtle is a very, very versatile shrub. Um, and I tell you, uh, it's usually sort of about June, July that my berries on my little myrtles ripens and I've got to be very quick to get those berries in order to dry them because the birds somehow also love them. Now, another plant that you might be familiar with is your Japanese honeysuckle or your Lodicea japonica. Um, it is quite a vigorous climber, it's got hollow hairy stems, and it's got those ovate sort of longish leaves um, with quite a bit of hairs on them. Um, and they have a very, very, very pungent smell. Um, the flowers sort of usually start off yellowish, and as they sort of grow older, they sometimes become whiter, um, even sometimes with a flush of pink or, or, or purple in the flower very 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 aromatic very scented and i remember as kids we actually used to pick the flowers and sort of suck out the um sort of juices that that's in the bottom of that little tube um just beware um later in the season the plant would have blue black berries and those are actually toxic to eat so don't eat those now they're native to east asia and china um, it's a very hardy plant and it grows best in full sun. Um, it's a slightly sweet cooling herb. It's antibacterial, it's diuretic, um, it lowers fever, reduces inflammation and blood pressure. It relaxes spasm and it even increases perspiration. So a very beautifully scented addition to your herb garden. Now, the next one, I think, doesn't need any, any introduction. I'm sure everybody is quite familiar with lavender or lavandula dentata is the species that I actually prefer, the French lavender, which is then sort of grown in those fields in Provence and in the Mediterranean for their fragrance, especially for the perfume industry. Um, there are other varieties available as well your Spanish lavender or your Stuckus lavender, your ex intermedias or your English lavender. So very, very many species and hybrids of lavenders are available on the market. Why I prefer the Dentata personally is because it's got a long flowering period um, most of the year um, and it's a slightly sort of um, denser, tidier shrub than your, your ex intermedias like your Margaret Roberts's, for instance. Um, the flowers are also um, especially um, the elegance varieties, um, Dentata elegance, has got very big flowers and they've got long stems. 
that makes it easy to pick them and, and even put them in a vase. Um, whereas your Stuckus varieties, the Spanish lavenders, they've got a much shorter um, flowering period, um, usually between October and the end of December. The flowers are also very big and spectacular, lovely scented, but the stems are short and the flowers are bored right on top of the leaves. So as I say, this probably doesn't need any introduction and lavender is mostly grown for its aromatic um, reasons, but it also has diuretic and antiseptic um, properties. Um, it's got like a sort of a scent close to rosemary and obviously the scent or the, the, the strength of the scent would differ from variety to variety. Um, but it's also grown in flower beds for, for the flower heads to be picked or to be dried for potpourris. So that is our lavender and remember it's not only the flowers that are scented, it is the leaves as well. Now another one that um, I often sort of get queries from is um, our rose scented geraniums. Um, now rose scented geraniums are just one again of the scented geraniums. Um, it's quite an erect shrub, it's got smallish flowers um, and um, sort of triangular tooth type leaves about six centimeters long and then they make those pale flowers and they've got those little sort of markings on on the two top leaves and these flowers are usually born in spring um, it's a very very hardy perennial like all your geranium species um, it's a very aromatic herb Again, I love to cook with rose scented geranium. It's lovely if you use some of the leaves, for instance, in sauces, like for a brown pudding or things like that. But again, the, the scent goes very nicely with, with all your white meats. It's quite a sort of a delicate taste, but it's also used for scenting candles and oils. Um, we do get other types of geraniums with, with other scents um, and they all sort of look slightly different. I'm thinking here of our lemon scented geranium or our nutmeg geranium. Um, most of your geranium oils are also antifungal, antioxidant and it acts as an insect repellent too. Now the Aloysia trifilla or lemon scented verbena, that is quite sort of a biggish shrub but can also be trimmed down um, and the word trifilla means three leaves and as you can see on the picture there the leaves are arranged at each node three leaves together. Um, it also makes sort of a lilac-y, small lilac-y flowers um, in summer and I remember as a, as a kid, we had one in our garden and my dad promised us that this tree was actually going to bear perfume. And every year as a small kid, I used to wait after the flowers for those perfume bottles to appear, which never did, but uh, not knowing that the perfume is actually in the leaves. Um, it's native to Argentina and Chile. It's a very, very hardy shrub um, and it grows best in full sun. Uh, it's an astringent aromatic herb. It's got very volatile oils. If you just touch it, you can immediately smell it. And that scent would also sort of stay on your hands for quite, quite a while. Um, the leaves are also used in herb teas, to flavor jellies, summer drinks, and even stuffings for poultry and for salads and salad dressings. Funny enough, um, again, some people use it as an um, insecticide um, because if you put like little bits of lemon scented verbena in little bags under your clothing and that, it sort of chases away um, fish moths and 
other other things that you don't want in your cupboard. The leaves are obviously also used in potpourris and the scent that it is, is retained for quite a long time. Now, <clears throat> the next one on my list is Rosa Rugosa or Dark Rose. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I've got this here is because all our roses that we have nowadays actually comes from this rose. Um, and they all actually hybrids of this rose. And you will find that actually all our hybrid roses are grafted onto this rose as well. You must have seen at times that sort of funny sort of shoot that the roses make um, and you are always recommended to cut that off. That is the shoot of the dark rose or the root system of the rose on which it is grafted. The reason for that is because your hybrid roses, their root systems aren't strong enough to actually sustain the plant for long periods of time and thus it gets grafted onto the dark rose. Now the dark rose doesn't flower that often. It's got a smallish um, flower, much the size of about an apple blossom or maybe slightly bigger. Um, it has got sort of a single petal layer. It's not, not sort of a doubly flower like, like our roses that we get today. Um, and it can be either magenta or it could also be sort of whitish. And as I say, these flowers appear in early summer um, and then it goes on to make rose hips, which you can see there on your right hand side, top right hand side of the screen. Now, um, it is actually not legal to sell dog roses in South Africa because they got um, naturalized in parts of the country and especially if you drive there through the Drakensberg and the Eastern Free State, you'll often see them growing next to the roads um, because the birds spread the rose heaps and these plants then grow from the seed. But I think scented roses always plays a very, very important role in our lives. And some of us plant roses, especially for the scent. Now, a lot of the new modern hybrid roses does not have much of a scent at all, but we do still get very old hybrid type roses, which were grown especially for their scents. And I'm talking of roses like Just Joey, for instance, which really has a fantastic, very strong scent. Um, your very scented roses, also, again, it's your older varieties or your old English roses, like all your David Austin varieties, would also have a very, very strong scent. So those are all types of roses that you could maybe incorporate into your herb garden if you so feel like it. Now, um, Corsican mint or Menta Requini um, is another scented herb. Um, and it is often planted on pathways where you walk over it and then it releases that lovely minty scent. Now, um, Menta Requini, which is Corsican mint, but we also get Penny Royal, which um, looks very similar and it's got similar scents. So those two, two plants are really very similar. Now the Corsican mint, uh, I think it doesn't take much guessing that it actually comes from Corsica and Sardina. It's very, very, very hardy. And even if it dies, more than often those sort of roots are preserved in the soil and once it gets water it will start growing out again and the what's more is you can grow them both in sun and shade they make a lovely display um, in the pathway of your herb garden where you can plant them between stepping stones and as you walk over it you can smell it it's a very strong aromatic herb with a very pepperminty scent and it's used to flavor liqueurs and it's also a very good insect repellent. Now, if you've got a trellis or you need some height there in your herb garden, um, Jasminium polyanthidum or pink jasmine would be the person to plant there. 
Um, very, very scented flowers. Um, and the, the jasminium polyanthum, they usually flower like early spring. So they're one of the first spring flowers to, to come out. And they literally sort of announce spring as it were. And what a beautiful shrub to have. Um, it cascades no end. It is a vigorously fast grower. So if you want to cover up something very quickly, this is um, the, the, the climber to plant. Um, they have these beautiful white flowers. When they start coming out, they sort of slightly more pinkish. But in spring, the flowers are born in clusters and clusters. You can hardly see any leaves on the plant. And the, the flowering season probably lasts about a month to a month and a half. And as for the rest of the time, it is quite a neat and tidy shrub then growing there in your garden. It's native to China and it will grow both in the sun and the shade. Um, they make incense and candles from jasmine. They make body oils. Um, and jasmine apparently uplifts your mood. The scent of jasmine is said to be useful in treating depression um, and emotional depression. Body massage with jasmine oil um, apparently uplifts your spirit, but it also relieves aches and pains. Now I think, and this is the last one on my list here, is our gardenias, which I absolutely love. And again, it's got a very, very pungent smell. And I often even just walking here through the nursery, pick a flower and then leave it here on my desk um, because it will actually sort of stay like that for like the next two, three days, even without water. And I would have this lovely scent of the gardenia in my office. Now the gardenia augusta is just one of the very many gardenia species. Um, most of them come from China and Asia. They best grow in semi-sun or shade. And what's important to remember is that if you plant gardenias is to plant them in acid compost and give them a bit of a mulch with some pine needles because they do need acid soil. And especially here in the Gauteng area, um, our soil is mostly alkaline, so you need to, to give it a bit of an acid supplement. I know we've got one listener that joins in quite frequently from Nisna area. Um, usually the, there the soil would be a lot more acidic and you'll see if you drive through the Nisna area when the hydrangeas are flowering, they would mostly be blue and that's an indication of the acidity of the soil. Now, <coughs> Gardenia flowers appear in summertime. They are white, waxy. They've got a lovely, lovely, sweet, captivating aroma. Um, some cultivars have single flowers. Others have double flowers. Sometimes you also get ones that's, that's sort of got a slight yellow tinge in it. They're not entirely pure white. Um, but what a lovely plant to have in your garden. It's primarily valued for its scented blooms, um, although you can use it for, for medicinal purposes and culinary purposes. The gardenia sometimes also makes a little fruit. It contains yellow pigments, and that is used as a spice, um, as a substitute for saffron, for instance. Um, and then the herb is basically loaded with antioxidants as well. Now, <laughs> last week, we um, showed you the footage that we did for the SABC2 earlier in the year, and I showed you the first part of the footage, which was basically an introduction to herbs. And today, I'm going to share with you the second part of this program, um, which is basically going to show you how to plant your herbs in pots. So without further ado, here we go. So 
So we thought we'll show you a bit of how to plant some herbs. And with me, I brought my two assistants, Bethel and Elton, and they're going to help me to show you how we pot up herbs. Um, because we're going to put it like on a little patio where it's easy for us to reach and where it's easy for us to feed the herbs as well. We are getting ready to plant some herbs. And you'll see what I've selected as containers is some clay pots or terracotta pots. Now that is very, very good for your herbs because the terracotta actually absorbs the moisture in the soil. And then when the wind blows through those porous cavities in the terracotta, it actually keeps the roots of the plant nice and cool. So it's a bit like a very primitive root aircon system, if you can put it that way. Now we've selected several herbs here and we've selected containers to actually fit the size of the herbs. Now with Alton there on that side, we've got some bay laurel. Now bay laurel can grow into a 15 meter tree if you plant it in your, in your garden, but we are going to pot it and we are going to prune it to size so that it doesn't get too big. Now along with the bay laurel at the bottom there, we're going to plant some nasturtiums. Nasturtiums great in your salad, but it's also a nice um, herb to plant with other herbs because it actually keeps the pests away. Um, and then along with that, we've got some onion chives, which we're also going to plant at the base. And then one of my favorites, parsley there. Now Bethel here, he's got a bit of a bigger pot and we're going to plant another selection of herbs here. We've got some lemongrass that we're going to put at the back. It's going to give us a little bit of height. Then we've also got some um, lavender that's at the back here. And I love this lavender. This is a dentata lavender or French lavender. Very strong. And it's actually got very, very pretty flowers as well. And then we've got some thyme too, because we've got thyme to plant some thyme. And this little thyme here is not your normal green thyme. It's what they call silver thyme. So it will give us a bit of color contrast in this pot. Um, but the taste would be the, exactly the same as your normal green thyme. And then in this pot over here, we're gonna plant a whole lot of basil because I need that for my cooking. And then we're gonna plant another herb in between that, um, that you can also use for petals in your salad. These are marigolds, and that's also going to help to deter the pests with the basil. So these two are actually very good companion plants. And then this guy here, He's a very bad neighbor altogether. It's a fennel, and fennel is great with your food, but fennel should be planted on its own because it actually releases things into the soil to kill plants around it so that it can grow bigger and have more space to grow in. So first of all, before we start planting, we're going to fill our pots with some stones in that, and then we're gonna fill it halfway with some soil. So um, you guys can start on that side and then I'm going to fill this one here with some soil and I'm just pressing it down nicely because once you water it you don't want all the soil in your pot to disappear. So you'll see I've potted it so that it's like halfway full. Now I've got my fennel here, and this is actually an interesting fennel. It's a bronze fennel, so again, I'm going to get a bit of foliage color, and it tastes exactly the same as your normal fennel. And I'm just going to decanter it from the pot here, just loosen it, and then I'm going to loosen the roots down at the bottom a little bitty, and then place it in my pot, and then I'm going to fill the rest of the pot with some potting soil. Now most herbs come in sort of pretty smallish pots, so it is recommended that you actually transplant these herbs because they won't thrive too much in this little pot. So it really is beneficial to either plant it into the open ground in your garden or to then plant it into a bigger container. Okay, so we can cut there. And then so 
Still have some popping slowly, better. You, you can help Alton plant there quickly as well as we finish this side. Better, you can have some three medigolds for that spot too. Of our herbs. 
Now, finally, what we need to do is we need to water our herbs and make sure, especially just after you've planted it, that you do a thorough watering. Through your plants. Make sure that the water runs through nicely. Don't let your herbs sit in drip trays in water because that will cause rot. Bethel, you can water that one for us. There's a watering can behind you. And then remember, every two weeks or so, get some mitrazole. It's an organic plant food. You mix a little on five liters of water, five liters, I think, is that size watering can. And, or you can use two lids too, if you want to invigorate your plants a little bit. Save the bottle well, mix it with the water, and you just water it through. And that will give your plants all the nutrients that it needs to grow very nice and be happy chappies. When you're ready to harvest your herbs, make sure that you use either quite a sharp shear or a decent secateur. Don't pull the herbs off because that would damage your plant and it won't stimulate growth in the plant again. Now, for instance, if we want to cut the lemongrass here, depending on what sort of plant it is, we're not going to cut the lemongrass here because that's going to make it unattractive. We're going to cut the lemongrass right at the bottom here so that we've got one stalk and we can use that. Things like lavender, for instance, you will cut the growth tips like that because that would stimulate the plant to actually push out and make more growth tips. And um, something like a bay laurel, again, you're not going to use that many leaves of the bay laurel at a time, but again, you would cut growth tips so that the plant can push out eventually and you will get more growth tips. So, that is it from us, Bethel and Elton. Thank you very much for all the planting. And I'm Sue, I'm your garden guru from Garden Shop. And if you have any questions, you can always send me an email. My email address is suebb at gardenshop.co.za. Or you can also go to our Garden Shop webpage where you will find all our details. Thank you for joining us. So that was just a little bit um, on how to plant herbs and in the next two weeks coming up we are going to, no the next three weeks coming up we are going to talk about um, culinary herbs and we're also going to talk about indigenous herbs and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to preserve herbs in some of our upcoming workshops as well. Now fragrant flowers aren't only there to inspire memories but it can evoke profoundly positive feelings um, often simultaneously um, and our olfactory receptors stimulate the part of our brains believed to create emotions. Putting it simply sweet smelling flowers makes us happy all round. Now, I think it's competition time again, and I just want to go here to our screen. There we go. And I've got my daughters here with me again today. Hello, Doris, how are you doing? Um, okay, how are you? <laughs> it is fantastic, it is. Um, and Doris has got our draw for us, and while she's mixing that up, just um, a quick sort of reminder, um, our vegetable gardening shop, which will be tomorrow at our Bryanston branch. And I think some of you that sort of do attend our Zoom workshops are going to be there tomorrow. Unfortunately, we are fully, fully, fully booked for the workshop. Um, but I intend to, to, to repeat the workshop probably early in September sometime, but I'll keep you posted on that as well. And then our organic gardening workshop, which will be on the 5th of June 
Um, so that will be all about organic gardening. Also at our Bryanston branch, it's a Saturday morning. So if you're interested in attending that, I do still have space for that. So um, send me an email and um, I can put you on the list. And then our next gardener's course will be starting on the 25th of August, also at our Bryanston branch. Um, just for your reference, we're currently running um, our second second gardener's course for this year. Um, and uh, I'm yeah, so happy with all of the students. They really, um, it's a, like a pleasure spending the Tuesday morning with them. So, Doris, you've got our basket there. Yes. Did you mix it up yes. nicely? Nicely. Have you drawn it already? Yes. You didn't yes. peek. Did no, you? no, 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 I didn't peek. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our competition today is um, sponsored by Kershaw. And just as a reminder, um, what are our prizes? It's in, in, in this lovely Kershaw's bag. And it's a lovely prize today. It's got some herb seeds in it, um, some Kershaw's herb seeds. Um, then it's got like a hand trowel and a hand fork. And then also a fantastic pair of secretaries. I wish they would give me one of these too. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it's all lovely and somebody is going to be the lucky winner of this. And the question today was, or yet, uh, last week was, what is the difference between an annual and a perennial herb? And our winner today is Maureen Ledger. Congratulations, Maureen. I know you've been attending these workshops um, most weeks. Um, and Maureen says annuals grow for one season and perennials live for three years or longer. And then she also adds, love today's session was constantly interrupted though. So <laughs> I had to ask to send the video to me. So Maureen, it was worth the while um, for you to actually um, watch the video, it seems like. Congratulations, and I'll be in touch with you. Then, for today's competition, another lovely, lovely prize, and it's spon sponsored by Mango Moon. And <coughs> just to let you know, Mango Moon imports these beautiful garden tools, gloves, and stuff from England. They all stainless steel. It's beautiful stuff, and they're putting together a hamper for us, not only for this week's competition, but also for the next three weeks. There will be three hampers that we'll be giving away, one every week. And if you want to go into the draw for this week, um, the question is, name any herb that is used for its scent or its fragrance, or its aroma, and I see we forgot to give you my email address, but you sent your answer to me um, at my email address. It's suebb at gardenshop.co.za, um, and I will show it um, on one of the later slides for you as well, so that you can send your answers and you can be eligible to win that fantastic hamper. I must say, um, when I started off as the Garden Guru, Mango Moon sponsored like a whole set of tools for me, including the watering can that you saw on the video today. And I've been using those tools ever since, and they really, really are fantastic. And they actually still look as good as new. Now, um, just for our final word here today, it's not only humans that's interested in the sense of um, the flowers, um, as you well know, cats love catnip. And um, you can see this is a catnip dispensary and this um, pharma pharmacist, um, cat pharmacist, he's asking the customer, <coughs> so what do you want? Do you want something that will make people say, 
that will make you say, oh, I love everybody, or do you want something that will say, wow, look at my poor, and um, the customer in question says he wants people to say, wow, look at my poor, <laughs> that scats for you. Um, just a repeat of my email address, if you want to enter the competition, You'll see it there in blue, subi at gardenshop.co.za. Um, send me an email. It's always lovely answering your emails. And I really look forward to it. It's the first thing I do um, when I get up after this workshop is I actually um, try to answer all those emails that you send me. Um, you can always phone me as well, 11 465 6485 And if I'm in the office, Doris will put you through to my extension. Um, so yes, keep those answers coming and I will see you next week and Doris will see you next week. And Doris, I don't know, did you have a posy of herbs? Because you smell lovely oh, too. Oh, I love herbs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Doris walked in here and she just <laughs> smelled so lovely. So my whole office is smelling terrific at the moment. That is fantastic because sometimes we've got those, those organic fertilizers here they don't smell so good <laughs> so that's it from us for today um my email address subi at gardenshop.co.za we also have our garden gurus at all our stores at broadacres parktown north brianston um and for those of you that i'm going to see tomorrow um i'm really looking forward to meeting you and stay safe and keep gardening until next week, same time, same place.